Hi, today I'm going to talk about anisotropic hyperelasticity. I'm going to give a very basic introduction to this topic uh, by first talking about um, the different kinds of uh, isotropic material models that are available and then a little bit about the anisotropic material models. And uh, I'm going to see the differences between the two and, and illustrate just how easy it is to actually use an anisotropic material model. So let's start talking about isotropic material models. The easiest way to deal, deal with this is to use linear elasticity, where the stress really is given by some kind of function of the material parameters, the elastic constants, Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, and the applied strain. And you can explicitly write that uh, relationship in this way, and other ways you can write it too. Um, but hyperelasticity, which is an extension of linear elasticity, is applicable for larger strains. And it's typically written in a very different form. So the stress is a function, not of the parameters and strains. There is a function, the stress becomes a function of the strain energy uh, function. So it's a function of a function. And then also the invariance of that deformation and the deformation gradient itself. And if you want to express the stress more explicitly, when you have these types of invariants, I1, I2, and J, you end up with this equation down here. And I've talked about that in some of my other videos. Let's now focus on anisotropic material models. The most basic anisotropic material model is an anisotropic linear elastic material model, where the stress is a function uh, of the strains in this way. So it's a linear dependence between stress and strain. And this is only useful for small strains. And there is, of course, some symmetries that go into this equation here. Uh, but that's basically what it is, very simple material model. Another way to formulate an anisotropic hyperelastic model is to use uh, the form that's shown here. This is a form where the stress is dependent on this partial derivative of the uh, strain energy density, but with respect to the strain itself, the strain tensor. So this is what's used in the Fung type material models. And some people like this, and it's used for soft tissue modeling often. Um, I don't usually use this approach, but I, the approach I use is to express the strain energy function in terms of invariance instead. So for isotropic hyperelasticity, we have a strain energy function that depends on the three invariants that typically are, are used, is I1, I2, and J. To make this anisotropic, it's very simple. All you have to do is to add additional invariants, I4, I5, and there are even higher order uh, invariants you can apply. The most commonly used one is I4, uh, and here is the equation for how I4 is calculated. And this is a little hard to understand the first time you look at it. So I'm going to try to explain in words what this is doing. It's basically, you have a vector A0. So some vector that tells you uh, which direction the, the material is a little bit stiffer. It's reinforcing uh, fibers, perhaps, in the material. So I4, if you calculate this, will be the square of the stretch of those fibers. So clearly, the energy that's stored in the material depends on the matrix response and also how much the fibers are stretched. And the fibers are typically much stiffer than the matrix. Um, so that gives you I4. So I4 gives you how much material is stretched in the fiber direction. I5 is this equation. It's a little more difficult to express in words what that means. But it's a coupling between the fibers and the matrix. And it's usually less important than dependence on I4. So in many material models, I5 is ignored. And you have this matrix response, and then you have a fiber contribution to the energy function. So let's do a quick demo how this would work in practice. I'm picking a material model that I developed a few years ago. This is the Bergstrom Boys anisotropic A-chain model. So it has a stress function that's shown at the bottom here. Uh, this is the basic uh, Aruda Boys A-chain model with one more term that gives you stiffness in three orthogonal fiber directions. So A, A and B parameters give you the, the stiffness parameters uh, in that, uh, these three orthogonal directions. So let's take a look in M calibration and how this works. So I have an M calibration window here. I have defined two different tension directions. If I double click on this, it's a virtual experiment. It's gonna demonstrate what happens. And I say this loading it to 50% strain in the one direction. And the other load case here is in the two directions. So these are two orthogonal directions that I'm going to make a virtual tension test in. 
And then here's the material wall. It's the Bergstrom Boys A chain wall. And uh, these are the first three parameters here are the traditional isotropic Ruda Boys parameters, and then we have the stiffness parameters in the three directions. And I, the only non zero ones here are in the one direction, A1 and B1. So if I run this once, we'll see that we get a stress that's higher in the one direction than the two direction. And how much higher will depend on the parameters that were selected, obviously. And in real applications, you wouldn't do it this way. You would have real experimental data in different orientations that you do tension or compression or shear tests, different orientation studies. And then you calibrate these parameters to the data that you have. So that's the traditional way, but this is really easy to use. And this is how one would uh, apply an anisotropic hyperelastic model. So to summarize, Anisotropic hyperelasticity is really easy to use. It's not any harder than a traditional isotropic hyperelasticity. And it's a building block for more advanced viscoelastic viscoplastic material models. And that's something that I will talk about in upcoming videos. And if you want to work with these material models and you want to like try it out, I encourage you to do it in M calibration. This is very simple to do, and it supports many of these anisotropic hyperelastic models. Let me know if you have any questions below.